You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Gold, crude oil, corn, soybeans, and more. With so many tradable products, the futures options market can be an intimidating place. How can you possibly keep track of the latest trading developments across so many different products? Don't worry, we've got you covered. Welcome to This Week in Futures Options, the program designed to help active futures options traders stay on top of this ever-changing marketplace. Each week, we'll break down the top trades, hot products, volatility explosions, and much more. This Week in Futures Options streams live, so be sure to check out our live stream via the Mixler app. That's M-I-X-L-R. Or join our live chat room at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. Whether you're an experienced veteran or a newcomer looking to separate the wheat from the lean hogs, this week in Futures Options has the information you can't find anywhere else. This week in Futures Options is brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by FTSE Russell, a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. For more information, please visit FTSERussell.com, CBOE.com, and CMEgroup.com. And now, get ready to break down the latest futures options trading activity. It's time for This Week in Futures Options. All right, everybody. That music means it is time once again for TWIFO. This week in Futures Options, the program where we break it all down on the Futures Options side of the fence. What's going to make it onto the show? Yes, why you have to tune in every week to find out. Maybe it'll be metals. Maybe it'll be ags or energy or equities or crypto. You never know what's going to make it into the crosshairs every week here on TWIFO. My name is Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com, as well as, of course, from the ever-exciting, at least we tend to think so around these parts, Options Insider Radio Network. Remind you, we're coming at you with a lot of other shows, not just TWIFO out there, usually a couple of shows a day. So if you're not listening to the full feed, you're missing out. And of course, wherever you're listening to this on demand, if you like what you hear, we're coming off the hottest, the busiest month in the 15-plus year history of the network. That's a lot of people. So we want to keep that trend rolling. A lot of people obviously need to discover these markets and are looking to discover and learn more about these markets. So help them out on their journey. Wherever you're listening to this content on the on-demand side, keep rating and reviewing if you like it. It does help the new folks discover the content. And of course, if you want to go above and beyond, you want to join us, not just for the couple of shows a day, you want to get exclusive shows like our pro Q&As and of course, our options oddities, as well as get live access to this and everything else we do Throughout the week, giveaways, a whole bunch more, theoptionsinsider.com slash pro is the place to go to begin your journey to the dark side. Let's see who's joining us on our journey today. I am pleased to say, holding down the CME Group and FTSE Russell hot seat today is our old friend, even though she hasn't been on in quite some time, Miss Catherine Yoshimoto, the Director of Product Management for the London Stock Exchange Group, which is, of course, the parent company of FTSE Russell. Catherine, welcome back to the uh, CME and FTSE Russell hot seat. It has been too long. 
Yes, indeed. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, Catherine has been, I think, since our last recon. So it's been pretty much a year. Obviously, a lot has gone on in the markets. We've had a lot of new listeners join the show since your last appearance. So maybe let's start there. Give our new listeners a bit of an update. What does the director of product management do over there at LSE? And and what is your take? What's been going on in the world of small caps since your last appearance? That's really been been catching your eye, Catherine. Yeah. Um, so as director of product management at FTSE Russell and LSEG Business, uh, I oversee uh, most of our market cap weighted equity index products, including the Russell U.S. indexes, our global indexes, our real estate and infrastructure indexes, just to name a few. Um, but yeah, what we do is basically, you know, we we make sure the product is is functioning as it's supposed to function, that we're listening to our clients feedback, work with our clients Um you know, to make sure they're getting what they need out of our index products. And really quickly, since you haven't joined us in over a year, let's just look back to the madness that has been 2022 so far. A pretty topsy-turvy year, to say the least. We've seen, of course, the rampant specter of inflation. We've seen broad concerns about market valuation. Of course, the invasion in February added another catalyst to these markets that have driven everything down, driven volatility up. So a lot's been going on since the last time you joined us, Catherine. Let's just dial it up to this year. What's your take on these these tumultuous markets that we've seen so far in 2022? Yes, absolutely. Um, Small caps um, have been feeling the pain a little bit. You know, with the volatility, large caps have weathered the storm a little bit better. Um, You know, energy has been the standout industry, I'd say, across the board. They've outperformed the other industries. Um, but there are uh, interesting pockets, um, you know, of activity just just in terms of, you know, we, we continue to see, um, uh, you know, uh, the additions to the Russell 2000, for example, we're, we're still seeing IPOs. It didn't dry up completely, <laughs> although it has slowed down compared to last year. 2021 was a record year. What's an IPO, Catherine? All anybody oh. cared about was SPACs for a long time, right? <laughs> <laughs> SPACs were the yeah. rate. Now those are dead, I think, too. Yeah, <laughs> initial public offering. So, so these facts, if they come in in the form of an IPO, are eligible if they meet all of the eligibility cr- criteria. But yeah, so initial public offerings, you know, we saw record additions in 2021. Um, they've slowed down quite a bit this year. Um, I think the final count being added to the Russell 2000 at this reconstitution is 19 IPOs and none to the Russell 1000. So, you know, the small cap is still you know, the the index that picks up more IPOs, generally the smaller companies. All right. A lot to unpack. And we're going to do more of that. We have a great day to have Catherine joining us because markets and in small caps in particular, let's just say uh, moving a little bit to the dark side this week. So let's start our journey by exploring that. Let's go a little bit of the old movers and shakers report. It's time to find out what's rallying on the light side and falling to the dark side at CME Group this week. It's time for the Movers and Shakers Report. All right, everybody. Welcome to the Movers and Shakers, the portion of the show where we break down everything lighting it up to the upside, a.k.a. the light side, and to the dark side this week over there at CME. Catherine, you are our guest, so you get to choose where we begin our journey. Should we... Keep with the trend of the day, which is mostly dark side. Should we start there or should we look to the upside, Catherine? Which way are you leaning today? Let's go to the upside. All right, let's let's break the dark side trend. We have enough gloom and doom to talk about in a little yep. bit. We'll we'll start with the optimistic. To the light side we go, listeners. By the way, of course, you guys can get this report in your hot little hands. If you follow CME, they tweeted out right before showtime. We do as well. This otherwise is one of the pro reports you can only get if you sign up over there at Bantix.com, B-A-N-T-I-X.com, which I definitely encourage you if you're listening to this show, if you're interested in futures options, you want a little bit more in-depth analytical offering than maybe you find at your traditional brokerage, then Bantix.com is the place you need to go to dive deep. We only scratch the surface of the analytics that are available there on this show. But to the upside we go. Number five, we've got some, uh, got some FX in the movers and shakers this week, which it has been quite some time since we've really sunk our teeth into FX. So maybe we shall, we shall head out there a little bit this week. We shall see. Number five, the yen USD. Seeing that on the movers and shakers up 1.3% this week. Number four, we've got corn. By the way, <laughs> you can see by just how low the numbers are that we're talking about, 1.3% is all it costs to break into the top five to the upside this week, that it is a 
pretty much 95% dark side week. This graph, I think, yes, we can do about a top six. That's about it. Beyond that, everything else is to the red this week. So the names we're listing are pretty much the only names to the upside this week. <laughs> number four, we got corn up 1.36%. Easy for me to say this week. Last week, it was number one to the upside, up six and three quarters percent. Number three, back to FX. We've got the Swiss franc USD up one and three quarters percent. I can't recall the last time we talked about Swiss franc on this show outside of maybe that big Swiss franc meltdown they had a number of years back. Outside of that, I can't remember the last time we talked about Swiss franc on this show. If you wonder if we're going to do it this week, the answer is no, unfortunately. Uh, 683 contracts only on the tape in the Swiss franc this week. But yen USD. 45,000 contracts this week. So there may be some interesting analysis to be done out there. Number two, our old friend Lean Hogs up 1.92%. A lot of you enjoyed that episode we did recently talking about the calendar flies and some of these ag-related names. So intriguing stuff. Lean Hogs back to the upside. They were number five in the other direction last week, off 3.38%. And number one to the upside with a very small bullet, more of a BB, heating oil up 2.44%. It was number two in this direction last week. It was up 5.86% last week, and it was only number two. That gives you a sense of how light the upside is this week. By the way, before you get excited, we're not going to go to heating oil either. Only 1,200 contracts on the tape this week. All right. To the dark side we go. And it was quite a fight (laughs) to break into the dark side top five this week, listeners. You had to really shed some value to make it in this week. So it's a dubious distinction, to say the least. Number five, we have the uh, E-mini S&P mid-cap 400. Don't talk about that one too often, but making the list this week off 9.5%. Then number four, appropriately enough, the uh, Russell 2000 off 10.6%. They're coming for small caps, including off nearly 5% just today. So a lot to talk about there. We'll get there in a few minutes, listeners. Number three, we got Nat Gas. I've said it before. I will say it again. Our three frequent offenders, Nat Gas, Lumber, and Bitcoin. I see two of them right now in our dark side. Number three, Nat Gas off 13.57%. Number two, they have been coming for crypto listeners. Bitcoin off a whopping 30% this week. What could beat that? Well, see, Euro dollars off 40.56%. I've said it before, the Euro dollars on Fed Week's kind of a bit of a moving target. It's hard to kind of aggregate one number, have one number that aggregates all of the movement out there. So take that 40% with a bit of a grain of salt, but still a uh, Bitcoin. On fire. Unfortunately, those options still not doing a ton of paper, but there's stuff to unpack across the board, including in the equities. So let's start there. It's time to explore the volatility swings, skew changes, and hot options trades in your favorite indices. It's time to talk equities. All right, everybody, welcome to the equities, the portion of the show where we break down everything moving and shaking out there. On the equity section, you guys can follow along for yourselves. You head on over to cmegroup.com slash TWIFO, T-W-I-F-O. That will get you to our reports. And if you go into that drop down there, go into the asset class, you'll see uh, ags, crypto, then energy, then equity indexes. We'll go to E-mini, and then from there, we're going to go into the Russell 2000 to begin our journey. Really quickly, let me set the table from a vol perspective, Catherine, then I want to dive into everything you guys have going on because it's a lot. <laughs> uh, right now, coming into showtime, listeners, RBX, so the VIX of small caps, almost a 38, 3780. It puts it up about 7.6 points. Remember last week, it was threatening to break 30 in the other direction. This week, right back up. VIX, same deal, 3260, up about eight points from our show this time last week. So a lot of action on the vol front, of course, it was a Fed week, so that is to be expected. Uh, VVIX, this has been a, a story we've been talking about for a couple of weeks now. VVIX, so the volatility of volatility itself dipped below triple digits for really the first time in over a year and only about the second or third time since the start of the pandemic. So it was a historic moment. It lasted about a week and a half, which is longer than I think most, most people expected, uh, but already back up north of triple digits here, up to 112 and about a third, up 23 points from where it was this time last week. Vol Q, so the at the money vol of the NASDAQ 137 and a quarter, up five and a half points. That puts that VIX to RBX, so the large cap to small cap vol spread at about a 520. That, that's about a little, little less than half a point, about four tenths of a point tighter than it was this time last week. And VIX to vol Q at about a 460, that's about two and a half points tighter. So that SP to NASDAQ vol spread has really come in. That is interesting. All right, Catherine, the table is set. 
a lot to be unpacked here in the world of all things equity. Let's get into what you guys are up to right now, because obviously there's a reason you're joining us today. It's not just because of the 5% meltdown nearly in small caps, but you also have some other things going on, including this, uh, this little recon thing, Catherine. Catch us up. What are some of the highlights? What is going on right now from a recon perspective with you guys? Yep. Uh, so right, we are uh, in the midst of Russell Recon, uh, the preliminary announcements um, for the ads and deletes, the additions and deletions to the Russell 3000 Rus- Russell microcap indexes were posted to our website on June 3rd. And then, you know, follow, followed by a query week. And now we, we are in the lockdown phase, um, working toward the final reconstitution day on June 24th at the close. Now, Russell Reconstitution is a really important annual event in part of the maintenance of the Russell indexes. We completely reset the membership, and this is important because it reflects uh, the markets, the large cap and small cap segments, um, as you know, the markets have changed over the past year, as you know. Um, so the, the break point got reset um, to $4.6 billion from a record high last year of $5.2 billion. So you can see that reflects the volatility uh, in the in the markets, um, and, and actually, it, we did a, a webinar with our um, a new global investment research head, Indrani D, and um, our uh, partners from CBOE and CME this week. And there were a lot of interesting insights shared. Indrani actually did some um, analysis on how the breakpoint of the Russell Index's reconstitution has actually correlated quite strongly with the GDP movements of the United States. So I thought that was interesting insights that she had to share with us. But again, we are working toward that June 24th uh, reconstitution date, and it, um, it it is a closely watched um, event. We do our, you know, we we communicate to the market early. Um, you know, the, the schedule was announced um, to the market in the first quarter, you know, so the market is anticipating this a- event. So <clears throat> we want to make sure that, uh, that there are no surprises as part of this reconstitution. And that's why we have this, um, you know, preliminary announcement day, followed the, by the updates and then working toward the reconstitution day. And it is closely watched because of the $12 trillion in assets benchmarked. Um, tracking the Russell indexes. And so over the past five years, if you take an average of the um, amount traded across uh, major U.S. exchanges, NASDAQ and NYSE, it's averaged uh, about $119 billion at the close over the last five years. That's a lot to unpack. You already hit us with some great data points, but you mentioned uh, some of the breakpoints there. I always find that fascinating. And you guys put out a release, uh, usually at the beginning of June, kind of breaking down how the reconstitution is shaping up for this year. It usually, as you mentioned, it kind of indicates some interesting broader trends that are going on with the overall equity marketplace. So why don't you share some of those interesting highlights and breakpoints with our listeners, Catherine? Sure. I already mentioned the breakpoint uh, decline, um, reflecting, again, you know, the state of the markets compared to last year's reconstitution. Um, I, I can talk about a bit about the industry shifts. They're actually overall relatively minor uh, for the Russell 1000 index, a large cap. But, you know, it's no surprise that with the with the energy industry standout performance over the past year, um, you know, the, the six small cap energy companies are moving up into the Russell 1000. And so the the weight doesn't impact so much the Russell 1000, but it it is a decline in the energy industry in the Russell 2000, which is then spread across other other industries like industrials, healthcare, financials, and technology. Yes, a lot of interesting data coming out of this year's recoms, looking at some of the other other data points here. For the first time since 2019, the five largest companies have reshuffled Alphabet, overtaking Amazon uh, for third, and Tesla replacing Meta, aka Facebook as the fifth. So a lot of the names you folks trade and ask us about all the time, making big moves in this year's recon. We also have Microsoft joining Apple. This was from June 3rd. So I wonder if we re-rack these numbers now, given the sell-offs, if this would still be the case. But from a couple of weeks ago, Microsoft and Apple, two companies exceeding $2 trillion in market cap for the first time ever in the history of Russell. So that was an interesting data point there as well. Again, if we rerun those numbers now, it might be interesting to see how that market cap is lining up other data points, energy and consumer discretionary industries dominating the companies that are moving up in this year's Russell recon. 
Uh, well, Catherine, you also mentioned you did an interesting uh, webinar over there with the folks from CME and SIBO, as well as our buddy Rick Rosenthal. He's been on the show many times. You were on it and a few others. You mentioned one takeaway about the breakpoints, but the interesting thing about these webinars is there's, there's always a few interesting takeaways or nuggets or pearls of wisdom that are usually pretty fascinating. So any interesting takeaways from that session you want to share with our audience here? Yeah, absolutely. The focus was, you know, just educating the market on how uh, people can use the Russell 2000 options and futures or, you know, even the 1000 um, in growth and value variants um, to hedge volatility in the market. So Paul Woolman from CME joined us. And then, as you mentioned, Rick Rosenthal from SIBO. Um, yeah, they had a lot of uh, interesting insights to share. Um you know, and then Rick, I, I did find an article that uh, Rick uh, wrote about the volatility of the, you know, using the RVX. So I thought that was interesting, too. Like, um, I think he was uh, talking about how actually in June um, there tends to be lower volatility, at least according to the VIX, compared to the other months throughout the year. Interesting stuff. Is that available on demand? If people missed it, they want to go check it out in the archives? Yes, uh, it's on brighttalk.com. Um, and if you just put uh, search for FTSE Russell, it should come up. There you go. Check out Bright Talk. Search for FTSE Russell. Get an interesting breakdown. It's called Four Decades of Russell U.S. Indexes Reconstitution, a Derivatives Perspective. So focusing in on what we like to talk about here on the show. Speaking of what we focus in on the show, let's dive into some of the options activity out here in all things small caps this week. You guys, of course, listeners, get on into that drop down, get into the Equity indexes, then get over to U.S. index. Then we'll scroll down to the Russell 2000. You'll see about 25,000 contracts on the tape already this week. So a pretty active week, all things considered, out there in Rutland. As I mentioned, we are selling off pretty hard, off nearly 5% today, about almost 8.5% for the week. So a lot of red to be found out there in small cap land. That's why it is in our movers and shakers this week, off 10.6% since our show last week. That's a that's a pretty big sell-off just in one week, listeners. A little bit shy of the 16 half level right now. 16.48 and a half coming into showtime. And of that 25,000 contracts, it's an equity. So as we expect, a full 40% of the paper is going away with one day <laughs> to expire. So we're not going to hang our hat out there. We're going to go a little bit farther out, listeners. We're going to go to, let's go to July, the July contract that expires right in the middle of the month, 15, 29 days to go on that contract. That is where about 19% of the paper went up. Get a little bit more relevant measure, I think, of vol and skew out there. Uh, what is the vol, by the way? You might be asking 32 in that July contract, up about one point. If we talk about that uh, contract going away tomorrow, that's up 49. That's up 16 points. But again, not much vol to really talk about in the contract that's going away tomorrow. It's mostly gamma on that front. Let's go out to the skew and last week, people wanted the puts 9.3%, but they want them a lot more this week. They are 12% premium. So you're talking a 32% at the money ball. You're going to pay a 12% premium on top of that, listeners, to get these 25 Delta puts. Is that worth it? That's up to you to decide, but it's going to be hard to make those pay off unless you get these crazy moves like we're getting right now. If these persist into next week, then you might have a case. Last week, 9.4% cheaper. The calls, nobody wanted the calls. This week, they want them even less, 11.7% cheap. So you're talking a nearly 12% discount for the calls, listeners, and a 12% premium for the puts. So that's a pretty steep skew we're seeing line up out there in small caps this week. In terms of the action, what was lighting up the options this week? It was kind of a bit of a tie. I said we're at the 1648 half level. It was actually the 1680 puts. We saw hundreds of those going up on Monday, and they're pretty active all week long, opening on Monday and more going up today. So they're opening 1680 puts on Monday. Chances are they're doing all right. If it passed his prologue, they were probably buying those, uh, which is kind of interesting. Oh, it looks like it might have been a vertical, 1660, 1680. So it looks like they might have had an opening vertical in that case. Or maybe they were rolling. Uh, either way, 1680 puts in the money puts now. It's not usually a trade we see dominating the tape that often in small caps. Usually it's much farther out, farther out of the money puts that a lot of premium harvesting going on out there. But in the money puts with about a day to go, that's a bit of a, a surprise. And usually people want to know about the small delta calls. In this case, these are large delta puts that are dominating the tape with a day to go. Let's go a little bit farther out. Let's go out to this July contract. And that's where we see something along the lines of what we, what we tend to expect now. These are the 1600 puts. So 
out of the money puts, about $50 out of the money puts. These are pretty active all week long as well. Again, looks like maybe a vertical, 1,600, 16 half going up a few hundred times on Monday. So a lot of put verticals going up, 1660, 1680, and then 16, those are going out tomorrow, and then 1600, 16 half going out in July. So a lot of put action, maybe some folks rolling their puts down. Looks like these were opening on both legs, though. So it doesn't seem like that was a roll. It seems like they were just putting on that uh, that put spread out there. What do you think about that, listener? 1,600, 16 half put spread. Do you like that? It's pretty much an at the money and a $50 out of the money put spread right there. Let's see any other interesting strikes lighting it up. Well, if you're concerned about small caps, <laughs> the 12 half puts were trading <laughs> in August. Small, only a few times, but still uh, kind of interesting to see that strike coming on our radar. And then it was 1,680 puts again in 1,600s, kind of doing the lion's share of the action. This is not a week where we saw a lot of small delta calls, listeners. Looks like the most calls we found here are going to be the 1680s going away next week. So these are the uh, the June expiring on the 24th calls. They went up about 400 times. So there were some calls. Uh, looks like they were pretty active all week long as well, mostly opening. So maybe some overriding going up up there. If you're seeing the way these skews are collapsing, that's probably the case. Uh, but intriguing stuff here, listeners. Hey, you know what? Before we roll out of equities, Catherine, hit on a few other product categories. We have some listener questions coming up, but I want to cheat and bump one of these up now. This is coming into our live chat right now. And this is perfect since we're talking about equities right now. Options Queen wants to know, with how volatile the markets have been lately, has it impacted how you prepare for the Russell recon or has it had an effect on the process? We get this question, it seems like a lot during recon timeless, Catherine, but it seems like this year it is perhaps more appropriate than ever. We're seeing a very volatile lead in, perhaps the most volatile in some time into recon. So Options Queen, I'm sure a lot of our other listeners want to know, how does that overall market volatility, how does that impact the recon process, if at all? The process is unchanged. We follow the published process, our rules, and, and that's what clients like about our transparent and objective process. Um, so, so the rank date is when all of the information for recon is based on um, and, and uh, basically um, in, in terms of, you know, we're working toward the reconstitution announcement. There may be volatility, but that doesn't really change the fact that we are going back to that May 6th rank date data. In terms of volatility, uh, you know, you're probably familiar with this, Mark. Um, we have our, you know, on recon day, um, we work with uh, NASDAQ on, and they have the closing cross and NYSE has their auction um, process. Um, so, so that, you know, they, the market closes at a single price for all these shares and um, stocks trading at the close. And moreover, you know, we do have a disruptions, market disruptions policy in place. Um, and, you know, we look back to a few years ago, you know, there was a reconstitution where it was on the eve of the Brexit vote or the, the day after. And, you know, we, we got through that reconstitution um, just fine. So, you know, we, we are prepared. Um, however, there is no change to the process. Um, and we are, you know, continuing to monitor the markets and we do have a disruptions, uh, market disruptions policy in place. All right. There you go. Great question. Options queen. Speaking of monitoring the markets, we have to keep on rolling. Let's monitor some of the other movers and shakers from this week, including we haven't been out to FX in forever. So let's head out there next. The dollar, the euro, the yen, and more. It's time to explore what's happening in major currency options around the world. It's time to talk FX. All right, everybody, welcome to FX. It's been so long since we've talked about this. I wonder if our producers even remember where that drop is. I'm glad to hear that they found it. Must have been a bit of a struggle. I threw him a curveball. All right, let's go out to FX. Go to asset class. You're going to scroll down from equity indexes into foreign exchange. I know it might be hard to find. We don't go there very often. And then we're going to go to the FX majors. Then we're going to scroll all the way down there to the yen USD listeners. Again, this was on our movers and shakers list this week lighting it up to the tune of 1.3 percent that's enough to make it into the top five this week also putting up some numbers Forty six thousand contracts on the tape in yen usd you know one of the narratives coming out of all this market tumult recently has been the strength of the dollar we were talking not too long ago again one of the other few times we've touched on fx on this show this year was just the 
close to parity we saw between the euro and the dollar. When's the last time we saw that? It's been quite some time, listeners. And now we're looking at this uh, yen USD spread. By the way, where is it hanging out right now? If you're wondering, if you don't follow this at all, listeners, it is at a 0. 0.0076. <laughs> the strike price is out here. Always a little bit fun. It's up nearly 2% just since Monday's session. So a lot of this lift coming this week here as yen stealing a bit of a march here on the dollar, it seems like this week. And again, 46,000 contracts this week of that 31%, almost 32% coming in this uh, July contract, the July weekly that has about 22 days to go. So we're going to hang out out there. What is the vol right now? That's the other area that makes it usually difficult to talk about FX too frequently on the show is because there isn't a lot of vol to speak of usually in these contracts. But that's not the case here in the yen USD as well. 18% up five, almost six points. That's a huge move in yen USD vol. So we're seeing some volume and we're seeing some volatility out here. Two things that make for an interesting trading product, listeners. So maybe maybe we'll be paying more attention to FX going forward on the show. We shall see. Uh, Skew-wise, let's see what kind of skew we're getting out here in FX this week in the yen USD. Last week, the puts were kind of cheap. People didn't want them. They were about 5% discounted to the at the money. This week, they have swung pretty much the other way. They're actually six-tenths of a point bid. So they've swung over, swung over five points in the other direction. That's interesting. So some folks wanted some puts, it seems like, this week. The calls last week, 8.2% premium to the at the money vol. This week, 1%. So the calls have come in. The puts are bid up. Let's see what we find out here. The leading culprit for all this paper this week are the, as I mentioned, we had the 0.0076 strike. It was the 0.0072. Again, we're talking about spreads like we're seeing in the FX contracts here. These strike prices can get a little bit confusing. Just stick with me here, listeners. <laughs> I'll try to make it as palatable for you as possible here. But the 0.0072 strike, these puts, 1,300 of them going up on Monday, another 1,300 on Wednesday. So they're opening, a, all of that was opening on Monday, the decent amount closing on Wednesday. So maybe they put this on and took it off again in a couple of days. That could be a nice little weekly trade. Given the movement we saw out here, that is not exactly... Uh, unforeseeable out here. So the 0. 0.0072 puts leading the dance, 2,600 puts. Again, 1,300 on Monday, 1,300 yesterday. As whopping goose egg, zero today. So they did all their paper they wanted earlier this week. And it looks like they, that's interesting. They may have done all right on those. And again, given what we saw out here from a put skew perspective, there was a lot of net buying on the put wing out here this week. Uh, we also saw, let's see, right behind those puts, those puts were leading the dance this week. We saw right behind it, we saw, some calls, the 0. .00835, again, fun strikes, listeners, going up pretty much about 1,000 times on Tuesday, 500 times today. Uh, so decent amount of paper out there, again, for a yen USD perspective out here. And again, most of that paper was opening. We don't obviously have the numbers for today. But again, given what we're seeing out here in the skew, probably reasonable to assume that some of that at least was some closing selling paper out there. Also, the 0. .007825 calls also lighting it up about a thousand times 500 times on tuesday 550 on wednesday opening both days as well so a lot of opening paper out here again this is a lot of paper for the yen usd so this is a this is a pretty rock'em sock'em robots week for them let's scroll around a little bit see if we can see any other interesting trades lighting up the tape out here in the yen if we go to the june contract that has about eight days to go we see the uh, 0.007325 puts going up 1,009 times on Wednesday. And that's it. That's it for the entirety of the week. <laughs> Zero every other day. But pretty much all of that opening on Wednesday. So someone having a lot of interest in those 0. .007325 puts. I love these. I love these strikes. These are fantastic. And the skew, let's see, the put skew out there in that contract, uh, the puts got bid up dramatically. They went from 5.2% discount to 25 percent rich so pretty much a 7.7 percent swing out there so probably reasonably safe to assume that some folks were buying those puts out there in the week three man a lot of action here across the board here let's go out really quickly just to see a thousand lot also looks like these oh yeah these are the nove contract a thousand of the 0. 0.0079 calls also going up a thousand lot looks like it was a vertical it was the 0. 0.0079 versus the 0. 0.0825 vertical going up a thousand times. They were closing on the 825, so it looks like probably a bit of a roll down, rolling down a little bit. 
on those calls in November. So yeah, thousand lots kind of flying fast and furious out here in the yen USD. Not something that we see all the time. I like this. Hopefully we'll have a chance to revisit all things a yen USD out here as well. But we have a little bit more time on the show before I want, I know some of our listeners want to get at Catherine as well. Let's go out to energy really quickly because that one lighting it up quite a bit as well. It's time to tap into the deep options well of black gold, Texas tea, nat gas, and more. It's time to talk energy. All right, everyone, welcome to the energy segment. Get on into that drop down again, pop out of foreign exchange. We're going to go up two segments to energy, going to go over to our frequent offender. Yes, that is nat gas once again on our movers and shakers off 13.57%. Since our last show, so NatGas taking a beating after everyone coming in and talking about how there's seems like there's unlimited upside concern for NatGas. We were threatening the nine and ten handles not too long ago. Now coming into today's show, seven forty one. So the the battle out there in Ukraine giveth and it taketh away. This week it is taking away huge destruction out here in value out here in NatGas down sixteen point two percent just this week. So. A lot of the sell-off in nat gas coming this week here. And, of course, it's the near-dated contract. Because, again, we're seeing a big move out here. So people want to have uh, some gamma out here. So they want to get about 34% of the paper going up in the contract, uh, the July contract that has 11 days to go. By the way, how much paper is going out here this week? You know, in a pretty active week in uh, in nat gas, we're going to see four, maybe 450,000 contracts. That's a pretty normal week you start getting it to 500 550 that's a pretty active week we're at 620,000 contracts already through thursday that's a very active week out here for nat gas not quite the 1 million days we've seen a few times but a pretty active week nonetheless and let's get out to this july contract we'll make an exception usually I like to go 14 days out but this one's 12 days and this is where so much paper is going up we're going to hang out here in this uh, in this front contract by the way the future 741 and a half so again down a buck forty three just this week. So a huge amount of bloom coming off the Nat Gas Rose here this week. Let's go out here. What is the vol this week? It's a seventy seven and a half. So still frothy, but down nearly seven points from where it was this time last week. Let's go out to the skew. Last week nobody wanted to touch the puts. They were at a four and a half percent discount. This week, kind of like what we we're just talking about in Yen USD, those puts have swung. They are now almost a full percentage point bid. So they've swung over five and a half points, 5.8 points in the other direction. Just since last week, the calls last week, 7.9% bid. This week, 4.2% cheap. So those calls have been annihilated, listeners. They've swung enormously, twelve over 12 points <laughs> since last week. So, wow, talk about the worm turning, at least for now. Again, this is in no means indicative of what's long term here in that gas as the product moves and ebbs and flows week by week. But still, at least for this week, the worm has turned aggressively back to the dark side. Where was the action this week of that 620,000 contracts? What was the big dog this week, listeners? It was the 11 calls. Yes, I said the 11 calls. Those seemed like they were pretty close not too long ago. Now they seem like they are in the distant rearview mirror. 11 calls going up 15,850 times again in this July contract that's going out in about 11 days. So a lot of action in these 11 calls. Uh, they were kind of opening and closing all week long. 2,300 on Monday, mostly closing. 7,700 on Tuesday, a good chunk of that opening. 5,300 again on Wednesday, a good chunk of that closing. Only 500 today, so kind of quiet today, but still over 15, nearly 16,000 going up this week. Most of that on Tuesday. If you were opening on the 11s this week, ooh, more power to you. Hopefully, you were selling the heck out of that strike, listeners. Uh, let's go out here. Right behind it, though, we have the six puts. Wow, what a it's 11 calls and six puts when we're trading at 745. Talk about a chasm between the two of them. 15,000 of those exactly this week. That is unusual in and of itself. Usually, we see 15,003 or 14,997. Nope, 15,000 exactly this week. The big day, Tuesday, 4808. Today, we saw 4477, 3140 on Wednesday, and 2575 on Monday. Looks like Monday was closing. The rest of the week was opening. And again, all that adding up to exactly 15,000 contracts on the week. So six puts, 11 calls going out 
in about 11 days. We're leading the dance out here. This is a ton of paper. Then right behind that, listeners, we have the 10 calls going out in August. So these have about 40 days to go. They did almost 15,000 contracts as well. 14,882 of these bad boys going up this week. The lion's share of those on Tuesday, 4,400 going up on Tuesday, most of that closing. We saw about 3,500 yesterday and today. Obviously, we don't know today's number from an OI perspective. Yesterday, a good chunk of that was opening. And then 3,200 going up on Monday, most of that closing. So, again, a lot of back and forth on the 10 strike this week as well. In fact, looking at a lot of these months out here, we see 10s were active as well in October. They were active in February of next year. Wow. We also had 2,300 of the 20 calls going up in March of next year. My goodness. That looks like that might be a 15, 20 vertical. Went up a thousand times on Wednesday and another thousand by 1300 times today. 15, 20 vertical for February of next year, listeners. What do you, I'm oh, sorry, March, a March of next year. Wow. What do you think about that? That's a pretty dire Pretty dire outlook. If you're concerned about that or speculating on that, that's not exactly good for uh, the overall health of society, let alone the energy market. Wow, crazy paper afoot out here, listeners. We're kind of coming up against it. We have time, looks like, for one more category before I know a lot of you want to get at us with the questions here as well. Let's mix it up out here. We haven't had a chance to talk a lot about ags that much on the show lately corns in our movers and shakers this week i know we have a lot of ag heads out there listening so let's head out there next it's time to get our hands dirty exploring the latest options trades and trends in corn wheat soybeans and more it's time to talk ags all right everybody welcome to the ag section get into that drop down it's pretty easy to find it's alpha order so ag is going to be at the top of that list then you're going to see grains and oil seeds and then corn at the top of that list as well. Corn is the big dog in the ags, after all. How big is that dog today? It looks like it's about average. A good week, around 400,000 contracts for corn as well. And we're at about 391 right now. So we're pretty much right in line with expectations from a volume perspective. And of that, looks like about 27.5% of the paper is going up in the July contract that goes out in eight days. <laughs> so... Trading like an equity a little bit this week. If we go a little bit farther out, we can find, yeah, let's go out here to the August contract that did about, looks like about 15% of the paper this week. That has about 36 days to go. So we have a little bit more time out there. What is the volume? You might be asking yourself. Well, first off, the AUG contract, the futures at a 741 and three quarters. That front contract is going out in a couple of days. That's at a 787 and three quarters. So Corn still looking frothy. I mean, the ags have had a topsy-turvy period in the wake of this uh, Ukrainian invasion. A lot of it, of course, going on the wheat side. But corn's been pretty interesting to watch as well. That August contract coming into showtime, that future, 70, 40, 741 and three quarters. The vol out there, almost a 41. It's up about two and a quarter points. So corn vol, nothing to sneeze at. You know, you're talking about VIX in the low 30s. Corn vol, almost 10 points higher than that. So that's... That's no small amount of juice out there. In terms of skew, let's see. The puts last week, 5.2% cheap. This week, 6.7% cheap. And to the calls, last week the call is 5.9% bid. This week, 4.9% bid. So the puts getting cheaper. The calls getting a little bit cheaper, at least as well, from a overall skew perspective. And in terms of action, what was leading the dance out here this week? It was actually the 800 calls. Going out next week, 11,000 of those lighting up the tape. That was the big dog. Kind of trading pretty actively all week long. The big day was today, about 4,000, 3,400 on Tuesday, 2,500 on Wednesday, 1,100 on Monday. Back and forth opening to closing on these 800s all week. So I guess as we approached it and moved away from it, we saw a lot more paper coming in and going out. Again, that makes sense. It's the round number strike closest to where that front future is. So it makes a lot of sense that we're seeing a lot of opening, closing paper out there. And then right behind that, we have looks like the 780 calls also going out next week. 6,300 of those, the big day of those uh, was Monday, 2,300, 1,600 on Tuesday, 1,500 today, and about 800 on Wednesday. Again, back and forth, opening and closing. Those are pretty much near at the money calls as well. So a lot of 
at the money call paper. That's pretty much to be expected. Let's go out to this uh, this AUG contract that we were just talking about out here. And out there, it was the 740 calls that were the big dog, doing about 6,300 contracts, all of that pretty much on Monday, 5,152 going up on Monday, all of that opening. So a huge, a huge block of these 740s going up on Monday. Then the rest kind of scattered paper throughout the week that only added up to about 1,000 contracts. Most of that was all on Monday. So that's a lot of paper on the 740s. I don't see a vertical or anything else that would have spread against that. It seems like that was just straight up opening on the 740s out there. And that could also explain why we saw a little bit of action in that call wing. Not a ton, but a little bit of action out there this week. Let's look really quickly. Also saw 800s also trading about 7,000 times in August. So I actually take, oh, excuse me, September. I actually take it back. Those were the number the number two there. They were about almost 7,000, 6,900. So the 800 strike, kind of the strike du jour, contract going out tomorrow. We saw those trading. We saw 11,000 going out next week of the 800 calls trading. 800 calls also trading in September, nearly 7,000 times. 800 calls going up actually 11,000 times in December as well. So they were active kind of across the board. This paper is very scattered, which is kind of interesting. It shows there was a lot of action kind of in multiple months, which is what makes corn interesting for a lot of people because it trades uh, pretty actively across a lot of different months. It's not all just front month at the money all the time. Uh, the corn 800s here in the December contract, they traded again 11,100 times. So they were actually the most active contract of the week. Uh, the big day for them was today, 5,400 today, 2,400 on Monday, 2,300 on Tuesday, about 1,000 on Wednesday, opening all week long. So a lot of opening paper on the 800s there as well. Not to be outdone, the 1,000s also active in December with about 10,200, all of that 7,000 going up on on Monday, 2,500 going up today and not much going up the rest of the week. So a lot of opening paper on the 800s and the pars, the 1,000 calls here in corn. Wow, a lot of action here in corn listeners. A lot of people have asked before, you know, where's a good starting point? I want to dip my toes into ag options. You could do a lot worse than corn. Look how much paper is going up this week. Look how much action there is across a broad variety of months. It's the closest you're going to get that is something that is reminiscent of an equity out here in the ag space. So if you're looking to dip your toes in, and if you feel like following the corn market, different rules of engagement out there. But if that intrigues you, I know it does intrigue a lot of you, then you could do worse than starting with corn. And we could certainly do worse than checking out your questions. Let's get to your feedback right now. It's time for your questions, comments, and insights. It's time for Futures Options Feedback. Submit your questions at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, stocktwits.com slash options insider, or via questions at the options You can also submit your feedback via our Options Insider Radio Network mobile app. Available for iOS, Android, and Kindle Fire devices. You can even ask your questions live via our Mixler chat room. So grab the Mixler app or just search for Options Insider at Mixler.com. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com. All right, everybody. Welcome to your feedback segment Uh, Catherine, we have a great question coming in here from Alan. He's actually asking a question that I wanted to pick your brain about as well. Let's read Alan's question first, and I'll I'll set the table about exactly what he's talking about here. Alan wants to know, what does Mrs. Yoshimoto think about our June 8th hypothesis? Does she think that Russell Recon is perhaps the culprit elevating all these stocks? All right, Kathy, you might be saying, what the heck is he talking about? I don't blame you. Uh, But this is something we have noticed now Really, since the onset of the pandemic, we first really noticed it starting in 2020, and then it started popping up again last year, the same cycle kind of repeating itself. We analyze a lot of unusual activity on this network, and frequently those names that we're analyzing are, let's just say, in the smaller realm. They're not the mega caps. They they sometimes pop up, but it's usually smaller, less heralded, less known names that we're analyzing out there. And we noticed a bit of a trend with these that in uh, 2020, a lot of them rallied all the way up until June 8th, and that's where they had their high for the year, and then they sold off the rest of the year. And then we came into 2021, a lot of names did the exact same thing. They rallied all the way up to June 8th, and that was their 52-week high, and then they sold off again throughout the rest of the year. And we're seeing names 
repeating that again this year. So again, this is something that is relatively new. It's only in the last couple of years that we have noticed this. And it's not universal, obviously. It's not every name, but there's enough names that it comes up enough that we have started talking about it on our network. And clearly, our listeners uh, want to know about it as well. And one of the only hypotheses that our listeners have put out that makes sense is potentially maybe it's some impact of the Russell reconstitution because what other major market events occur in June every year? There aren't that many, <laughs> let alone on June 8th. So again, it's, it's still a working theory that we have, Catherine, but a, I'm curious and sounds like Alan is as well. Are you familiar with this phenomenon at all? Have you noticed this? And what do you think of the notion that perhaps it is Russell recon that is somehow acting as a magnet to elevate these stocks. And that's also the apex for them for the year. They sell off the rest of the year as a result. I was not aware of air. <laughs> Sorry, I hear an echo. Um, I was not aware of the June 8th hypothesis, but um, there we go. That's better. <laughs> um, but But your theory is that I mean, so so there is a huge institutional following of our Russell indexes. There has been, you know, a following built over decades. You know, the the retail segment perhaps is newer to following the Russell indexes. I mean, we do post our preliminary announcements on that first Friday in June, and it's possible there is some. Uh, some relation. However, I don't, <laughs> I, again, I wasn't aware of it. And, you know, June 8th is an interesting date because it's not just after the announcement either. <laughs> so, um, because we announced, uh, or posted our preliminary additions and deletions on the third, um, this year and last year was the fourth. So, you know, it's, it's not exactly correlated with June 8th. Um, uh, however, that being said, you know, there, there are people who trade around the Russell reconstitution. And of course, active managers are, you know, they, they're free to trade around it, too. It, it is typically the passive money that is looking to keep their tracking error low against the benchmarks. And so they may, you know, they, they will typically plan on trading at the recon close. Um, however, there's a lot of uh, additional money. So I mentioned uh, approximately 12 trillion dollars following the the Russell indices uh, as benchmarks um, but uh, only about two trillion of that is passive money so you know there's ten trillion dollars out there that is benchmarked to the Russell indexes that could be you know um, uh, de- trading around the reconstitution ahead of that recon day yeah it's not exactly a smooth hypothesis because it doesn't line up well <laughs> with recon that's why I said it was a bit of a, a bit of a left field hypothesis. a little bit of a stretch <laughs> but you know it, it it's at least our listeners are are intrigued by the concept of recon they're putting the two together. We started actually capturing some of this data because it is mm-hmm. starting to become just uh, that strange that frequent enough that it's worth discussing like party city is one of the names we talked about for example they had their peak on june 8th of this year nicola same deal nicola of course on the electric car side uh, imax the name we've been talking about a lot those are just three of the recent ones we've talked about on the network that have exhibited that exact same chart the 52 week high on june 8th and then selling off to the rest of the year again I, I, who was it who asked this alan that hypothesis is as good as any other that we have right now i wish i had an answer for this this is something that's been going on and on for some time what strange majesty or magic or magnetism is there about that date june 8th i do not know i do not know why so many smaller cheaper names like party city for example hit their apex on june 8th why that name continues to be relevant year after year now again june is the russell recon time it's about as close as we can come to pinning that on on recon but your guess is as good as any right now here I'm glad we at least had a chance to float this to you, Catherine. You can discuss it with your research team, and they can yeah. ha- they can have a good laugh on this one, I think. And, and you did say that, that this phenomenon was observed starting 2020. Yeah, Is it does right? seem like a newer phenomenon post-pandemic, okay. yes. It, it does seem like, I mean, I think more retail investors might be tracking the indexes more in the past couple of years. Maybe that has something to do with it. <laughs> Yeah, that could easily be as well. I mean, there's a lot of moving parts, but it is strange. Like It's gotten to the point now, Catherine, when we do unusual activity on the show, I almost don't even have to say when the high for the year is because I have a good chance of it being June 8th. <laughs> it's, just, it's that frequent of a date where it's like, wow, something is going on here. I don't know what it is. Uh, perhaps it is recon. 
related, adjacent paper. People are trying to get ahead of it. I don't know, because you're right, it doesn't line up with the actual dates of recon itself. But uh, a strange one. Alan, good question. I, I wish we yeah. had the I wish we had the answer. <laughs> but hey. Yeah. The thank, cr- thank you for the question. That's an interesting phenomenon. We need to sick the crack research team at FTSE Russell on this one, Catherine, <laughs> see if they can get to the bottom of like actually, oh, it's this strange underlying mechanic of the market that no one knew about that is doing it. But I'm sure there is some interesting underlying cause. We're just not we're just not getting there. Speaking of getting there really quickly, we didn't get the chance to get to crypto on the show this week, listeners, but obviously Crypto names have been under some, shall we say, selling pressure of late. Our question of the week this week is, quite simply, the crypto bloodbath is making it a good time to revisit this question we asked you back a few months ago. Quite simply, which level will Bitcoin hit first, 10,000 or 50,000? A lot of you have weighed in. You have until tomorrow, listeners. This is our question of the week. Then we'll reveal the final results on volatility views. Uh, Catherine, I know you don't watch Bitcoin, so I won't make you hazard a guess in terms of where you think Bitcoin is going. But I will ask you to guess what you think our audience is voting for. Are they voting for 10,000? Are they crypto beers or 50,000? Are they more in the crypto bullish camp, Catherine? Uh, let's go bears. Well, you're in Chicago, so bears at least. That, that, <laughs> it is the right guess there. But uh, yes, 10,000. 72.2%, Catherine, uh, choosing 10,000. So for all you Bitcoin holders out there, maybe it's not the number you wanted to hear. 27.8% saying 50,000. So a sizable percentage of you <laughs> going the 10K route. Agree, disagree, get on over to at options and make your voice heard. You have until tomorrow. So those folks listening on demand on the podcast, you'll have a chance to vote too. All right, everybody. Catherine, I told you an hour was fly by because we're done. That music means we have drawn to a conclusion once again in Twifo this week. A lot of living packed into one hour. But before we go, Catherine, you had a chance to share a lot of great data, a lot of great analysis with our listeners regard to all things small caps. Before we go, if there's anything else you wanted to share with them or perhaps any interesting data points or dates you want to leave with our audience, now is the time, Catherine. The floor is yours. Oh, thank you for um, having me on the show. Um, you know, we didn't get to talk about a uh, paper I published around the four decades of Russell Reconstitution. I would encourage people to check that out to look at how the methodology has evolved over time to accommodate, you know, investors and, and really looking for uh, to minimize turnover and investability, right, it, with, with the aim of improving investability. So, you know, there was that question earlier in the show about, you know, methodology changes. It gives you an idea of the evolution, how the methodology has evolved and, you know, what, what types of uh, enhancements we do consider and, and whatever changes we make are very thoughtful and we wouldn't do it without warning um, and clients in the market would have advanced notice of it. So I encourage you to check out um, the paper in addition to the webinar uh, with CBO and CME. There you go. That paper is called Four Decades of Russell Index's Reconstitution. You can find it where you find everything else, small caps, footsierussell.com, F-T-S-E, russell.com. Just search for that Four Decades of Russell Index's Reconstitution paper. Of course, while you're at it, give them a follow on the old Twitter. There's a lot of great data coming out throughout the week, not just during our show, at FTSE Russell, all one word. Give them a follow on Twitter. And of course, you know where to go to check out all the reports we have cooking for you and a whole bunch more. CMEgroup.com is the place to go to begin that journey. Of course, slash Twifo will get you to our reports for this show. There's a whole bunch of other great educational and analytical content for you over there on the website. Begin your journey. CMEgroup.com is the place to go. We have to get on out of here, but don't worry. We're back again tomorrow, noon central, 1 p.m. Eastern for volatility views. Then after that, for all of our pro listeners, back again with options oddities. Who knows how many more names will be peaking on June 8th? (laughs) We'll find out tomorrow on options oddities. Then back again next week, another episode of This Week in Futures Options. Stay safe out there, everybody. This Week in Futures Options is brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. 
CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world manage risks and seize opportunities. CME Group offers the deepest and most liquid options on futures across all asset classes, including interest rates, equity indexes, foreign exchange, energy, agriculture, and metals. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by FTSE Russell, a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. Investors in the U.S. and around the world are using FTSE Russell indexes to benchmark their investment performance and create investment funds, ETFs, structured products, and index-based derivatives. Many Options Insider Radio Network listeners will be familiar with the Russell 2000 Index. Russell 2000 Futures and Options are currently trading on the Chicago Board Options Exchange and CME group. For more information, please visit ftserussell.com, cboe.com, and cmegroup.com. This broadcast is intended for informational and educational purposes only and does not constitute trading advice or the solicitation of purchases or sale of any futures or options. The rulebook of the applicable exchange should be consulted as the authoritative source on all current contract specifications. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the optionsinsider.com. <laughs> 